Presented by the United States Air Forces in Europe. I am the Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Same story. Round trip tickets. <laughs> Standing at the window of the cheap hotel room and looking out over the outline of lights and neon that was Kansas City after sundown, Eve Benson felt a pressing sense of concern. That the condition would pass, she was certain. She'd managed before, she would manage again some way. But she wasn't thinking of that now. Eve Benson was being sorry for herself, forgetting her good points, the quiet, restless beauty in her face, the sullen attractiveness of her features. She was annoyed at the city and the world. Her action of raising the window seemed almost a preparation for the voicing of her resentment. But the words never came. Instead, other voices nearby caught her interest. Thirty thousand, that's the deal. A lot of money. A lot of money. Ah, that's for the return of retirement stuff. Thirty thousand and no questions asked. That's what the insurance company says. Yeah, that's what they said. You smile strangely, don't you, Eve? Listening in ironic amusement. Thirty thousand, one of the men next door said. They're talking in thousands, while you stand so close by, wondering where you'll get the money to pay your hotel bill. You start to close the window, and the voices grow suddenly louder and raised in anger. It won't work. You can't get away with anything like that. I worry about that part. You just worry about this. <laughs> you freeze to the spot, don't you, Eve? Your outstretched hand touching the windowsill remains fixed and rigid like a statue. And then... You hear someone climbing out under the fire escape. A man is outlined by the staccato flashing of a neon sign on top of the building next door. He hesitates, turns to cast a last glance back at the room he just left. You get a clear look at his face, don't you, Eve? And then he starts down the escape steps. You lean out. See the man drop to the ground and disappear into the shadows of the alley below. You wait, staring. Men run out of your room to the hall. The door to the room next door is partially ajar. You run to it and glance inside. A man on the floor, lying very still. You're about to turn and run when your eyes fasten on something you see. A wallet, isn't it, Eve? Yes. With part of the contents filled out, a few bills, and among them, a train ticket. Something that you could use. Yes, Eve. A train ticket for the West Coast, San Francisco. And nearly $200 in currency. It's an answer to your problem, isn't it? You lose little time in packing, leaving your room by the same method as the man who fled only a few moments before. The fire escape. Well, no. No, it's just that you look like someone I knew. <laughs> now, I have another reason to be sorry that I'm not. <laughs> you, uh, you just get on this train? The Kansas City, yes. Uh huh. An interesting place, huh? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> He smiles, doesn't he? He can even do that. This man who pretends to be so nonchalant, so much at ease. You wonder how he would feel if he knew that you'd recognize him. That you were certain he was the man you saw fleeing from the hotel room next to yours. That you shared his grim secret of murder. Hey, um, uh, something wrong? What? <laughs> the way you're staring at me... You said I'm not the guy you thought I was, but is there some other reason? Oh, no, no, there isn't anything. Uh-huh. We've some distance to travel together. There's no reason why we shouldn't become better acquainted now, is there? No. No, there isn't. No reason at all. 
You're unable to avoid the young man sitting across from you, aren't you, Eve? A man who's introduced himself as Frank Gilbert. A man you're certain committed a murder in the hotel room next to yours. By the time you reach Oakland and board the ferry boat that will take you to San Francisco, the young man has become quite persistent. You know, uh, uh, I do think you're trying to avoid me, Miss Benton. Eve, any reason? <laughs> no, it's just that I've had things on my mind. I've, I've been thinking about a job. Well, perhaps I can help you. I, I know lots of people. Well, no, I have something waiting for me in the city. Well, just a thought, huh? In case it doesn't work out, I wish you'd give me your address. Well, I'm not sure what it will be. Oh. Mm-hmm. Well, mine's 4950 California Street. I've got a flat there. And I'd really like to see you again. <laughs> You want only to rid yourself of the persistent Mr. Gilby, don't you, Eve? Finally, once ashore and in a taxi cab, you feel he's no longer a worry. You register at a small hotel on Geary Street. Dismiss him from your thoughts. But late the following morning, as you're having breakfast in a small diner, you're listening to the radio and something the news announcer says that you are thinking about Frank. The increase increased during the balance of this year. In local news, the Perryman jewelry case has reached a stalemate with the valuable still unreturned. According to private investigator Leonard Quinn, a contact with an underworld character in Kansas City failed to take place. It has since been revealed that the insurance company had made a tentative offer of $30,000, with, as we understand, no questions asked for the return of the necklace to Mr. Quinn or to the home of wealthy Mrs. Evans Perryman in Hillsborough. However... Oh, I wanted to hear that. Oh, sorry, lady. The guy was just about through. Oh, what was that name you mentioned, Mrs. Evans somebody? Perryman, Mrs. Evans Perryman. Lives down a peninsula. Perryman, I see. You were acquainted with the lady? No. No, but I've heard of the name. Yes, the words of the newscaster set you thinking, didn't they, Eve? Especially the mention of $30,000. That was the figure you heard Frank Gilby mention in that Kansas City hotel room. Strangely enough, after you've taken a cab to 4950 California Street, walk up the stairs to his flat, you hear the words again. Yeah. This time over the transom as Frank yeah. talks on the telephone. When? Yeah. Well, that uh, 30000 with the permanent deal, you get me the money and you'll get the necklace back. Yeah, that's right. Take a couple of days to contact out of town. Yeah, sure, all right. Bye. Yeah? Oh, Eve. Hello there. Hello, Frank. Hey, you changed your mind, huh? I thought you'd look me up after all. Uh, Come on in. Come on in. Thank you. Say, how'd that job go? Is it all set? Well, no, I, uh, I didn't go there. Well, uh, maybe I can help on that, like I said, huh? I'm sure you can. I'm sure you can help me, Frank. Yeah, anything at all. <laughs> I'm glad you feel that way. Because I'm referring to this Perryman deal, the thirty thousand you're going to get from Leonard Quinn and the insurance company. What? Mm-hmm. The thirty thousand you wanted all for yourself. That's why you killed your partner back there in that Kansas City hotel and took the necklace. I happen to be in the next room. I see. You've got a new partner now, Frankie. Oh, have I? Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't try anything if I were you. I've taken the necessary precautions. Oh, but uh, effective. If something happens to me... Yes, the cops find out about that little accident in KC and they come looking for me, right? Right. Uh-huh. Well, 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 looks like I'm uh, sort of behind the eight ball, huh? Well, you don't have to stay there if you play it right. Well, that means your way. My way. Uh-huh. Okay. Have you talked with Quinn? Uh, no. Now, now, Frankie, I think you have. Okay, so I talk with him. He thinks I'm just a a go-between. Well, naturally, you wouldn't tell him you'd killed a man to get the necklace. That sort of arrangement you made with him. Well, he gives me the dough, and a couple of days after I contact the guy with the necklace, I bring it back to him, that's all. Quinn trusts you that much? Sure. I've handled deals like this before with Mr. Quinn. When's he going to pay off? Tonight. Fine. Well, it's all settled then. I'll meet you here after you've collected from Quinn. What time? I'll be back by nine. 
We'll open a bottle of champagne to celebrate. I'll buy. Naturally, it's your party. See you tonight, Frankie. Nine. It was simple, wasn't it, Eve? Easier than you thought. And now you're in partnership with a murderer. A temporary partnership, you tell yourself. And it'll be worth $15,000. And that's all you want from Frank Gilby. After it's over, you'll move on, start a new life. Yes, it was all so simple, talking your way into that partnership. But as the day wears on, you begin to wonder about it. Perhaps it was too simple, Eve. You really hadn't expected Frank to accept your demand so readily. The more you think about it, the more certain you become that he'll bear watching. Early that evening, you hurry back to his flat. And as your cab turns into California Street, you see Frank board a cable car. Oh, uh, driver. Yes, ma'am. Uh, don't stop. I've changed my mind. I want you to stay close to that streetcar. Yes, ma'am. But not too close. Okay, I guess. <laughs> At Montgomery Street, you watch Frank step into an office building. Sitting in the cab, you wait, keeping your eyes on the entrance. A quarter of an hour goes by, and then he comes out, walks back to the corner, and hops onto a cable car as it starts to climb up the hill. A driver. I know. You keep close, but not too close. Exactly, driver. Close, but not too close. You know, lady, it ain't none of my business. You're quite right, driver. It's none of your business. Follow Frank back to his flat. See him hurry inside. You're quite certain you know what he's up to, aren't you? But you want more time to think about it alone. So you tell your cab driver to keep going. Finally, an hour later, you return to Frank's place. Well, hello. You're sort of early, aren't you? Well, I've changed my mind, Frank. I'd like to go with you when you get the money. Oh, well, uh... That's been called off. Called off? Yeah, uh, postponed, I mean, you know, until tomorrow night. I just got a phone call from uh, Quinn. He said he hadn't had time to get that money from the insurance company yet. Oh, I see. Um, well, sit down, sweetheart. I was looking forward to that champagne. Well, now, there's no reason why we can't celebrate in advance. Matter of fact, I was I was just about to call you. Well, where are you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought we might have dinner together, you know, North Beach, Fisherman's Wharf, maybe. That sounds interesting. Yeah? What do you say? I've always wanted to see Fisherman's Wharf. Fine, we'll start there then, huh? All right. Oh, say, there's a nice little restaurant on Broadway I think you'll like. It's got the best veal scallopini in town. Oh, I'm sure I'll love it, whatever it is. <laughs> oh, uh, Frank. Yeah? Uh, my gloves, I must have left them on the chair. Oh, sure, I got them. The moment he turns around and steps back into the room, you release the lock on the door. Now you won't need a key, will you, Eve? Then quickly you reach down and tear a hole in your stocking. In a moment, Frank returns. There we are. Oh, thanks. All set. All set. Oh, dear. What's the matter? Oh, will you look at that? A run in my stocking. Just look at it. Ah, yeah. (laughs) That's quite a run. Thanks, this one I've seen in a long time. Uh, my best dear. You won't mind stopping by my hotel for a moment, will you? Of course not. Let's go. At your hotel, you leave Frank waiting in the cab parked at the entrance while you hurry inside the crowded lobby and right on out the door on the other side. You go back to Frank's place, slip quietly into the apartment, find what you'd expected, an envelope containing $30,000 in his suitcase. Frank was going to double-cross you after all, wasn't he? Yes, you've proof of that now. You hurry back to your hotel room. You put in a phone call to the railroad station. Check the trains leaving town and make your reservations. As you hang up the receiver... I'm wondering about you, sweetheart. Oh, Frank, I'm sorry I took so long, but I had a phone call. Oh. My, uh, my brother. This from home? Yes, and not too good, I'm afraid. My father's had another attack. I'm terribly worried. Oh, it's too bad. Frank, uh, about tonight, I 
Don't feel much like celebrating, you understand. Oh, sure. sure. No, I wouldn't be much company. Don't give it another thought, baby. We'll have dinner tomorrow night. Oh, I think. I'm really sorry. Sure. I'll see you tomorrow, huh? You watch from your hotel window. See Frank get into the cab and drive away. Quickly, you pack your things and check out of the hotel. It's two hours before your train leaves. Time to have dinner. But first, there's one thing you must do. You've made up your mind about that, haven't you, Eve? From the moment you found the $30,000 in Frank's flat, you step into a phone booth and call the police department. I want to report a murder, officer. The Alton Hotel in Kansas City five days ago. The killer is here in town. What? He's arranged a deal with Leonard Quinn, a private investigator. Anything to do with the Perriman necklace robbery? Everything. The party I'm talking about took the Perriman necklace off the man who was killed in Kansas City. Uh, go ahead. I suggest you contact Mr. Quinn. Get him to tell you who he's made that deal with, and you'll have the killer. Uh, will you give me your name, ma'am? No, I won't. Goodbye. <laughs> Now you're settled comfortably on the train for Los Angeles. It moves out of the station, rumbles through the outskirts of San Francisco. Lean back and close your eyes. It's been an exciting day, hasn't it, Eve? And as you listen to the rhythmic click of the wheels, you doze off. And then suddenly you're awake again. You're staring at the headlines of the newspaper in the hands of the man sitting opposite you. Man murdered in Kansas City Hotel. Linked by police for theft of Perryman necklace. A cold wave of fear sweeps over you. Then he lowers the paper. Hello, sweetheart. Thanks. Surprise? <laughs> Switchboard operator at your hotel just couldn't resist the ten spot. I see. How stupid of me. Wasn't very smart of you to walk out with my 30,000, either. And what were you going to do? Oh, you got me all wrong, honey. I was going to surprise I'll you. I'll bet. <laughs> okay. So each of us try to double-cross the other. What do you say we call it even now and split the money between us? Huh? All right, Frank. Well, look, we ought to try to get along. Now, sweetheart, you have something on me, but I can make trouble for you if I want to. Oh, can you? You're in this as much as I am. Now I can always say you helped me do that job in Kansas City. Our uh, coincidental appearances would make it pretty hard for you to deny. Yes, I guess it would at that. Oh, so let's just bury the hatches, huh? I still have to turn in the necklace. You know, we can go back to San Francisco in a couple of days. Why not? And after that, we can do the town together, baby. Have a lot of laughs. You know, I got a hunch this this partnership could turn out okay. Huh? <laughs> I was just thinking the same thing, Frank. We'll just forget the past. Think only of the future. All right. A bright future for both of us, sweetheart. If you play it smart. Don't worry, Frank. I intend to play it smart. <laughs> It was a shock to find Frank Gilby on the train to Los Angeles. After you thought you'd slipped away from him in San Francisco with the $30,000 all for yourself. But now he's on the train with you. And though he's agreed to an even split, you're certain he has plans to get the full $30,000 from you. And sitting beside him in the club car, you decide on a plan of your own, don't you, Eve? You listen attentively as Frank sips several highballs and continues to talk about your bright future as his partner. Sometime after midnight, the club car now deserted, except for you and Frank. You decide it's time to put your plan into action. You yawn, say good night, leave Frank alone in the club car. Next morning, when the train pulls into Los Angeles, you will have the $30,000 safely tucked into your suitcase, and you're certain it's all yours. You're still confident as the police board the train. Talk quietly to some of the passengers. Finally, the lieutenant comes around to you. Yes, that's right, miss. 
According to the conductor, this man talked with you in the club car last night for quite a while. Well, you say he fell off the train, Lieutenant? How terrible. He seemed like such a nice young man, too. You didn't know him before, I mean? Well, no, no. I'd never even seen him. We chatted in the club car for a while, just train conversations. Oh, I see. Hey, Lieutenant. What? Uh, how do you reporters hear things so quick? Oh, we got to keep our readers up on what's happening in our little old world. Come on, Lieutenant. I want this to hit the next edition. What's with this guy who fell off the train? Where did it happen? Just out of San Luis Obispo. And he didn't fall. He was pushed. No. Pushed? Why, what makes you think that, Lieutenant? Yeah, what's this all about? The San Francisco police got a tip last night. Phone call from a woman about a payoff. A private investigator hired as a go-between was making a deal for the Paramount necklace. At the party this woman said killed a man in Kansas City. Another killing? Yeah. Looks like the investigator and the party that had the necklace agreed to meet on this train for the payoff. Quinn completed his part in the deal all right, because when his body was found, the Paramount necklace was in his pocket. Quinn? Yes. The man who was pushed off the train. Leonard Quinn. You mean the man I was talking to was a private investigator? That's right. He told me his name was Frank Gilby. Hmm. Well, Quinn probably wanted to keep his identity covered until he'd completed the deal. I see. Quinn was the last person to leave the club car. The killer must have opened one of the outside doors between cars, then waited on the platform, and when Quinn came along, pushed him off the train. Well, you think the killer who pushed Quinn off the train was a Kansas City killer, too? Well, that's what the woman who tipped us off told us. Now all we have to do is search the passengers and examine their luggage if necessary. I get it. And if you find the 30 grand... We'll have our killer. Oh, I'm uh, sorry to bother you, miss, but as long as we're here, we might as well start with you. Join us again next week when once again the United States Air Forces in Europe presents The Whistler. This is Air Force Sergeant Don Cormay speaking.